Tina Koto and my Haramai, welcome. Uh, we have some beautiful babies here at Grace City, don't we? In the first service, we were dedicating actually John and Amy Thingston's uh, daughter, Elsie, who's just so beautiful. And then, like Seth, man, so it's such a handsome boy. Uh, and you, Seth, come from a very talented family. I, Samuel, I heard your song on Spotify this past week. It is so good. So, yeah, well done. Hey, uh, through this series, we have been uh, looking at how ordinary people can change the world. It's a big claim, isn't it? Uh, And it comes from what I call the Mona Lisa of all sermons that Jesus himself gave. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, But Jesus spoke uh, to his followers and about how his followers can actually be salt and light in this world. The idea is that his followers can stop the decay in our world and point people to a very different way of life. Radical statements. And he said, the way we do this is that we, we become Beatitude people. Now, if you're new with us or kind of new to what the Beatitudes are, these Beatitudes are effectively these, these pithy, radical statements that Jesus made. Statements like, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. And every week, we're kind of like unpacking one of these pithy Beatitudes to look at, well, well, how do the merciful go on and change the world? How is it that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness can, can change the world and so on? So we've been unpacking these. We've got two more to go, one today and the, the final one next week. And as you come to the end of these, we're looking at really the, the final one today, just change the order a bit. You, you might assume that, you know, if you're like having this kind of influence in the world, you know, things are gonna go really sweet for you. You know, you're gonna be well off, things are gonna go well, you're gonna be loved. I mean, what's not to love about people who, they're not puffed up with self-righteousness, they work hard as peacemakers, they're constantly giving mercy and forgiveness and more forgiveness. We expect these people to be admired and to be respected. And as such, as we come to this final beatitude, there's a sense where we get kind of surprised. This is what Jesus says. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you, say all sorts of evil, you know, horrible things said about you because you're my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Now, this isn't what we expect, is it? It's it's at least a couple of surprises that I see here. Surprise number one, expect persecution. Again, we naturally think, don't we, that if we kind of like embody these beatitudes, we're gonna be liked. I mean, sure, I I don't think we kind of expect people to burst into, you know, for he's a jolly good fellow, and so say all of us. That's probably going too far. But we kind of expect people to kind of like look our way and want us to be around. So if we're honest, you know, we kind of expect Jesus to say something more like this. Blessed are you when people shall praise you, be amazed by you, be deeply impressed by you and speak well of you. Then you can rejoice and be glad. Uh, For apparently they spoke well of the prophets who went before you. When the reality is, if I kind of translate what Jesus is saying in kind of a JD way of saying it, it would be like, blessed are all the Christians in a post-Christian culture that are hostile to all they believe. Fortunate are those who are made fun of as losers, looked down on as stupid, stomped on, and the recipient of horrible, unfair things said about you. I mean, this is the reality, isn't it? This is the surprise number one that we should expect difficulty. But then it's like there's a second surprise here too, isn't it, about the way we're meant to respond to difficulty in our lives. What does Jesus say? Be happy about it. And if that wasn't already brutal enough, he goes on to say, what? Be very glad. (laughs) I mean, what in the world? I mean, is Jesus delusional? Uh, I mean, how how would you feel if you're facing injustice and horrible things said about you, being lied about, and somebody says to you, just cheer up. (laughs) Be very glad about it. I mean, it feels a bit like mean-spirited, doesn't it? So what do we do with this? See, if either of these or both of these things surprise you, I think it means either that Jesus is out of sync with reality or we are out of sync with the way of Jesus. And as a pastor, I think it's a sicker one. So we might be tempted to place our hands over our ears and like tune out these kind of words, you know, la, 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 don't wanna hear right now. Or perhaps we actually need to lean in and listen to what Jesus has to say 
about our expectations that are out of sync with the reality of the way of Jesus. So you might be here and you might be exploring faith. Perhaps a friend invited you along and they would love to see you kind of cross that line of faith and you kind of like hear something like this and you're like, wait a second. Why would I sign up for something like this? This doesn't sound cool at all. And it's a fair question. And in a few minutes, I wanna talk about why Christians, both past and present, have expressed joy even when they're going through some horrid situations in life. But first, let's look at this first surprise, the reality of persecution and difficulty for followers of Jesus. Again, let's look again at what Jesus says to say, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. God blesses you when, not if, but when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you, say all sorts of evil things against you, because you are my followers. Remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. So if I were to sum it up, Adjust your expectations. Prepare for difficulty. I don't know if you do this, but I like to kind of adjust my expectations in life and play that like mental trick uh, at times. You know, when, when people say, oh, you've got to go to that, that restaurant, JD, you've got to try that, you know, adventure over here and go on that holiday destination. I, uh, you know, it sounds really good, but I try to lower my expectations and in in just in case I kind of get to that restaurant and actually it's not very good. So I try to lower my expectations. If I get to that movie or whatever it is, you know, I, I, you know, expectations are higher. It's almost like Jesus is preparing us, isn't he? He's trying to go, I want you to realize the reality of what you're gonna step out uh, in if you're a follower of mine. He's trying to prepare us so that we're not caught off guard, we're not caught off by surprise when difficulty comes. You see, what I've noticed is there's a version of so-called Christianity out there that proclaims that if you just believe enough, life will go well for you, you will be prosperous, uh, you'll have no ailments, things will go well for you, you'll be loved by everyone, nothing can go wrong in your life. And when people take on that kind of framework, when they do face difficulty, as they will according to Jesus, they start to question the whole thing. But you see, Jesus isn't the problem. The problem is the expectations that have developed in the person who embraces that way of thinking. And, and we should be prepared for this. Actually, when you just read the Bible, as I encourage you to do, there's, uh, you know, as Jesus said right here in the Beatitudes, the prophets were persecuted too. So just unpack some of that. Think about people like Moses, who kind of appears in those first five books of the Bible. Uh, He was the guy who led Israel out of slavery and led them into the promised land, a dynamic leader. And yet Moses was, you know, he's ridiculed, he's slammed by his own people. Uh, They raised questions about his agenda, his motives. Uh, His own family members give him stick. And you think about people like Daniel, you know, his peers again try to get him to lose his position. He's thrown into the literal lion's den. This isn't, this isn't very cool. Uh, the last few uh, couple of months I've been going through with some of our leaders here at Grace City, the, the story of Nehemiah. And, and Nehemiah, you know, he's, a, he's an ordinary guy. He's not a, he's not a pastor. He's not like a you know, professional Christian uh, that's you know, paid to be good. Uh, he, he, he steps in. He's trying to bring uh, flourishing to the city of, of Jerusalem. Uh, he didn't sign up for difficulty, but he gets there and, and people question his agenda. They're trying to take him out, literally trying to kill him, uh, deliberate attacks on his life. It's really hard for him. You know, these are the leaders who were serving God, but they faced difficulty. In fact, the writer of Hebrews, it's this uh, book in the the New Testament of of our Bibles. Uh, The writer of Hebrews looks at all these so-called heroes of faith. He gets to the end of Hebrews 11 and he says this. Some of these, you know, heroes of faith, these prophets, some were jeered at. Their backs were cut open with whips. Some uh, others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. I mean, this is like R16, isn't it? Others were killed with the sword. Some were, went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute, oppressed, mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering around deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. I mean, it's graphic. Uh, these, these are people who loved Jesus, who, who followed after him, and yeah, this is the treatment they got for it. And with all that in mind, listen to what Jesus had to say to his followers the very night he was arrested. And he's talking to Christians, which, so if you're a Christian, this is including you and what he says. He says, if the world hates you, 
Remember, it hated me first. This is strong language. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it. You're no longer part of this world. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. You point into a different way of life. Since they persecuted me, Jesus, naturally they will persecute you. If they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. And again, Jesus gave these words to his immediate disciples. So there was like 12. And even one of those 12 became a betrayer that sold Jesus out for like 30 shekels. Uh, hardly anything at all. Uh, I mean, what's going on? And then out of the other 11, you know, one of those you know, uh, 10 uh, were martyred, killed for their faith. The final one, the 11th one, uh, was sent out on exile in the island of Patmos. It was pretty rough for them. Uh, the people that followed Jesus. And in other words, Jesus says we should adjust our expectations. Again, when we read these Beatitudes, we might think, well, surely people that take like a serving posture where they seek after peace and they champion humility and they're turning the other cheek and they're forgiving people again and again and again and they're pointing people to a different, better way, surely. I mean, what's not to like? But we know Jesus lived out these same Beatitudes and he was crucified so Jesus says, don't expect anything less. Don't expect anything less. If you're in company with me, expect persecution. Expect someone to roll their eyes at you when you say you're a Christian. Oh, she's one of them. It's why you might be sidelined or you might find your role disestablished or you fail to get ahead. It's why things might go hard for you as a follower of Jesus. So adjust your expectations. Prepare for difficulty. Now that deals with like surprise number one. Before we get to surprise number two, that's all about uh, how we're meant to be cheerful about that. I uh, wanna deal with something else. Ensure that the reason for your difficulty is actually Jesus and not you. I mean, it's cliche in relationship break, breakdowns, isn't it? But you know, when somebody you know, takes you out for their coffee or, and they say, it's not you, it's me, which normally means what? It's you. So when it comes to persecution and difficulty, sometimes it's not actually Jesus, it's me. Sometimes I'm the problem. Uh, sometimes, you know, I've, I've met people, you probably have too, that will say things like, you know, I'm being persecuted at the moment. And they tell you this story and it's like, yeah, nah, I think you kind of deserve that. You were just rude. You were, a, you know, you, you said, th- you, you, you could have done that differently. This is actually about you, it's not actually about Jesus. You know, I've been guilty of this many times in my life. I'm probably the only one among all of us by the sounds of it. <laughs> but you know, when there's some backlash, you know, it's, it's really easy for Christian people to say, you know, I'm being persecuted. I read an article uh, this past week uh, in The Atlantic uh, from Alan Noble, who has this article entitled The Evangelical Persecution Complex. Kind of sums it up, doesn't it? He says, if we as Christians want to have a persuasive voice in a pluralistic culture, we have to discern accurately when we are victims of true persecution and when it is only imagined or when it is greatly exaggerated. I think he hits it on the head. So how do we discern the difference between that? Well, actually, it's a question that came up in New Testament times too. You know, 2,000 years ago, this, this growing movement of Jesus was spreading and, and the Roman Empire was trying to, you know, stamp it out. So people were losing jobs, they were being imprisoned, some were being killed for their faith. And so one of the leaders of the church named Peter, one of the early disciples of Jesus, wrote a letter at the time seeking to discern when it's genuine persecution and when it's something else. So he says to this group of people who are undergoing difficulty, he said, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. I'm pretty sure Peter was reading the Beatitudes and it's like quiet time that morning. But then he says, if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any kind of criminal or even as a meddler. Do Christians ever do any of these things, particularly that last one? Of course, they never meddle in other people's circumstances, do they? They never look down their nose at anybody. You know, he says, if you do these things, kind of expect it. However, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed of it, but praise God that you bear the name. In other words, you know, if, if, if what you're doing is just rude and abrasive or, or criminal, 
that's on you. <laughs> uh, there's a fair critique, fair judgment on you for doing that. But if you are doing it for the sake of Jesus, again, he says a chapter earlier, how is it to your credit if you receive a beating or some consequence for doing wrong and endure it, but if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. You know, that's the discernment process. So adjust your expectations, prepare for difficulty. And secondly, ensure that the reason for your difficulty is actually Jesus and not you. So assuming that we're in these kind of areas, we come to that second surprise. Remember the part that Jesus says, when you face that persecution or difficulty, you're meant to do what? He says, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you, say all sorts of evil things against you because you're my followers. Then he says, say it out loud, be happy about it. Be very glad. And as I said earlier, you know, for someone experiencing difficulty or persecution to be told to cheer up, I mean, it seems a bit like mean-spirited. And again, if you're like still exploring faith and your friend invited you here and you know, they want you to cross that line of faith and you're probably looking to them right now going, why would I sign up for this again? And again, it's a fair question. So let me tell you the story of one of the earliest followers of Jesus who, who suffered joyfully in his service for Jesus and why he was joyful about it. His name is Paul. Now, if you're a, a Christian here, you're probably aware of his story. He was an early missionary who, who wrote most of the letters we have in the New Testament of our Bibles. And he was once, get this, a persecutor of Christians, and he had this dramatic encounter with Jesus. So he went from like fighting Jesus to now like following Jesus. I mean, radical story. And his story is contained in the book of Acts in the Bible. So no one can argue that Paul wasn't following the leading of the Spirit. I know one can argue that he wasn't you know, seeking to do mission for Jesus. He's preaching Jesus. He's doing what's right. Surely things are gonna go well for Paul. But this is how Paul describes his experience. And get ready, it's quite a list. He writes, I've been put in prison more often. I've been whipped times without number. I faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, that's like with the rocks kind. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I've worked hard and long and during many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty, have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. I mean, it's quite a list, isn't it? I mean, just take one of that, those aspects on the list, that, the aspect of prison. One scholar estimated that Paul spent as much as 25% of his missionary career in prison. Now, now prisons anywhere in the world are tough places to be, particularly 2,000 years ago, the prisons in Rome. I am... Um, I sat in that ancient prison cell where scholars believe Paul sat at one time. Uh, here's a picture of it. It's quite an emotional experience for me as I sat there, just trying to reflect on, on what it was like to be in the shoes or the sandals of the Apostle Paul. You know, the conditions couldn't have been any worse than we can imagine. Uh, Paul has been beaten, likely stripped naked, severely flogged, so utterly humiliated. The bleeding wounds would go untreated. Uh, his leg and wrists are in chains, making it impossible really to sleep. Most cells were dark, unbearably cold. There's a lack of water, a lack of food. There's cramped quarters. It's sickening stench in the air. His body's in pain. He's been mocked. He's been slandered. His dignity has been utterly stripped from him. But listen to the way he responds at one of these moments he was in prison. He's just been preaching about Jesus. People start to come to faith and apparently that starts to affect trade because some of the people in particularly this area of Philippi in this story, uh, they've been uh, oppressing people and when they come to faith, people are starting to pr promote the respect of all people which Christianity upholds. And so it's affecting people's trade and so they have Paul thrown into prison because they want trade good, right? And this is how Paul responds with all this that's gone on in his life. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing 
hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening. I mean, just imagine this scene. Here's Paul in chains, stripped naked, sore physically, gone through all the shame, the humiliation, and there he is, bless God in the sanctuary, bless God in the fields of plenty, bless God in the darkest valley, every chance I get, I bless your name. I mean, it's just absurd, isn't it? I mean, who does that? Who does that? And in fact, right right here in this very Roman cell, Paul writes a letter to a church in Colossae who's going through a really tough time. Some are losing their jobs. Some relationships are breaking down because of their faith. Uh, Some of them are wondering about giving up on faith because they hadn't expected difficulty. And Paul writes to them and he says, quote, right from this Roman cell, I am happy. I am happy because of what I'm suffering for you. You know, I'm treated as a loser and I'm happy about it. I mean, and it's probably just like one of those those weird people that, you know, just bring on the suffering. I don't think that's it. He goes on and gives his reason. He says, my suffering joins with and continues the suffering of Christ. And and that word uh, joins with, this literally fills up. So so one translation says, and it's kind of hard to get your head around this, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. So I like to illustrate it this way, and I've, I've kind of done this before as we've thought about like suffering and difficulty, because I think if we can get, get a grasp of this, we start to understand what Paul's saying and why he can be so joyful when he's undergoing suffering and difficulty. So think about this water here. It's just got some food coloring in it. as suffering. This is uh, the suffering that, you know, every, every single drop in this jar can be a comment that somebody has made that's unfair. Uh, something that's been said when somebody's lying about you. The, the physical abuse you take, the, the difficulty, the disestablishment of a role, all those type of things that can happen in people's lives because of their association with Jesus. It's all the suffering. In fact, in fact Jesus uh, speaks about suffering kind of like water. He says, I'm gonna drink from the cup of suffering. So, so it's almost like thinking about suffering in this very liquid form that we, that we take on in, a, in our body. So think about Jesus' story and what he suffered. Uh, first, he is born into our world, leaving the glory of heaven with the humiliation of being born here in a manger. He grows up. He is a refugee running for his life, even as a baby, a child from Herod wanting to kill him. He steps into ministry and even his hometown rejects him. It's more suffering. He goes on, even uh, one time he's stepping into Jerusalem and the religious leaders pick up stones in order to kill him. We read that the religious leaders uh, call him the son of Satan. He must be demon possessed or something must be going on in his life. Talk about slander. He continues on in ministry and even one of his 12 disciples sell him out. He betrays him. Uh, And then in the moment of need, the very night that he's about to be arrested, all of the other disciples run for their lives and Peter denies even knowing Jesus. It's like drop after drop after drop of angst, the suffering that Jesus is taking on in his life and then he's arrested, he's stripped naked, he's brutally beaten, he's lashed, crown of thorns on his head and crucified. I mean, his cup of suffering overflows. You can't get more suffering than what Jesus went through. And so as the Apostle Paul reflects on Jesus' life, he starts to think of his own life and suffering. Even though he's quite a list, he, he starts to think about it and goes, actually, every, every comment that somebody's made that's, that's lied about me, every Every difficulty I've gone through, every one of those, those beatings, those, those five lashes I had of the 39 lashes from the religious leaders. Every time I've gone into to prison, 25% of my ministry career. Every time I've been stoned and left for dead. Every time I've been rejected. Every time I've gone through something difficult. It's like, it's like there's something filling up in my flesh, filling up in my body that brings this alignment between where I am and Jesus. And because of that, I rejoice. Now, it's not that Paul wants the pain. He's not like that. He's not saying that. He's saying, 
every single drop, every false accusation because of my alignment with Jesus, it helps me come to appreciate Jesus more. It, come, it brings this empathy into my life, this alignment with Jesus because I so want to be associated with Jesus and his teaching, his life, his death, knowing therefore I'll be associated with him in the power of the resurrection. And so he says this in uh, another uh, letter that he wrote as he talks again about suffering. He says, I wanna know Christ. So I wanna know Christ. I wanna experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. So I wanna suffer for him, sharing in his death so that one way or the other, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. But if I'm gonna experience that the power of the resurrection, I also just need to be so involved and enmeshed in Jesus' life that all of the experiences of, of his teaching and his life and even his suffering and his death allow me to really experience the power of the resurrection in my life. Uh, this past month, I've been uh, reading a book by Australian historian, John Dixon. It's called Bullies and Saints. And it chronicles that the persecution that there's so many have faced, particularly in the first 300 years of church history. And he makes this beautiful summary. He says, reading the early sources, it's clear these early Christians actually felt like they were victors. Huh? I mean, they're treated like losers. How can they feel like they're victors? He says, they believe that true power to change the world lay not in politics, the judiciary, or the military, but in the message of Christ's death and resurrection. You know, whatever we make of a miraculous resurrection all these years later, the first Christians really believed it. And they saw it as proof and a pledge that God vindicated the suffering Jesus and will one day vindicate his suffering church. And he says, this is what Christians, this is what made Christians good, even cheerful losers the thought they had already won. Love that. Uh, their role was simply to remain true to the way of Christ, seeking to transform the world through prayer and service and persuasion and suffering. See, they actually believed, he said, as I do, that Jesus rose from the dead. They were witnesses of it. And so they gave their life to this belief. They gave their life. They gave everything. They were willing to endure suffering because of their belief in Jesus and so they stepped into following the whole way of Jesus, of what he taught, how he lived, how he suffered. They're willing to take all of that on because the resurrection was to come. So question, why did these men and women and children and teenagers of faith endure? Answer, when they were treated as a loser, they knew they were on the winning team. And it's why followers of Jesus, even in the last few decades, have also gone on in similar ways. Think of people like Nelson Mandela. In prison for 27 years, viewed by some as a traitor and even a criminal, uh, now a symbol of reconciliation and justice. But during those 27 years, he felt like a loser. Think Martin Luther Jr., prominent leader in the civil rights movement from 1955 until his assassination in 1968, significant influencer, treated like a loser. Think of the way of Jesus. This is the way of Jesus. So you see, you may not experience what Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther Jr. or the Apostle Paul will experience, but lots of people do. In fact, earlier this year, the World Watch List reported that 365 million Christians in the world face high levels of persecution for their faith. That's one out of seven Christians in our world today. A British government report from the past couple of years revealed that Christians are among the most persecuted minorities in the world today. And it's hardly ever reported in mainstream media, even though it remains one of the most widespread human rights abuses in the world. Perhaps that's telling in itself. You see, a modern example in December 2018, 100 Christians from uh, underground church in uh, Shangdu, China, were arrested and detained. Most were uh, released soon afterwards, but the leader of the group, Wang Yi, was secretly tried in the Chengdu Intermediate People's Court, given a nine-year detention of hard labor. In a letter smuggled out just before he was detained, he writes about his philosophy, and he says this, the mystery of the gospel lies in actively suffering, even being willing to endure unrighteous punishment that the cross means willing to suffer when one does not have to suffer. For Christ, he says, had limitless ability to fight back, yet he endured all the humility and hurt. 
And what I find challenging and humbling in stories like this, you don't find Pastor Ye whining or plotting or even pleading for help. Instead, there's a strange resolve to to hold the truth of Jesus while pursuing this path of peace. It's a non-retaliatory, just taking on the suffering. Why? Because you've read what Jesus had to say about who's blessed. You're you're blessed if you are persecuted. The fortunate life, Jesus said, is, is those who suffer with them because one day they will also rise with Jesus. So if you're exploring faith and wonder why people like Paul and Pastor Ye can endure such difficulty, persecution because they're Christians, it's because of what's promised both now and into the future. They actually believe what Jesus has to say right here in the Beatitudes. That God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right for the reason the kingdom of heaven is theirs. It's a beautiful promise. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. And actually, that's like word by word verbatim to the very first beatitude promise where God, uh, Jesus said, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. It's, it's how our journey begins in this moment of faith when we respond to Jesus and we find the kingdom of heaven is ours. And as we step out and identify our lives with Jesus, we can still celebrate the kingdom of heaven is ours. Word by word verbatim promise from the very first beatitude. And interestingly, all the other six Beatitudes right in the middle are all about future. Here's a list of them. You know, uh, they will be comforted. They will inherit the whole earth. They will be satisfied. They will be shown mercy. They will see God. They will be called children of God. But bookends right at the beginning and the end of these Beatitudes, it's present tense. The kingdom of heaven right now is theirs, is ours if you're a follower of Jesus. See, see, why can you endure persecution and difficulty and mockery and, and, and horrible, untrue things said about you? Answer, because the kingdom of heaven is right now yours. You can grab it. Even though you're treated like a loser, you've already won. And that's a big idea I want us to leave with today. That when you're treated as a loser, realize you're on the winning team. Now, none of this means that you need to sugarcoat the difficulty of what you're going through. It is painful. It is hard. It is wrong. But you see, you can also choose to accept the situation as a situation where God can work and bring further development in your life and and actually bring influence in the world around you. And you can step into even the difficulty with this profound sense of freedom because even though something might be being taken from you, you suddenly see it as you're choosing because you're choosing to associate yourself with Jesus and his teaching and his life, even in his suffering, knowing there is something so much more to come. Because the good life, the blessed life, the fortunate life is not about a cessation of suffering or difficulty. It's about the certainty of our Savior's presence, both now and forever. And so, if this is Jesus' very full cup of suffering, and this is the Apostle Paul who continues to fill up in his flesh what what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions to use his language, what's your cup like? Because as a follower of Jesus, we should expect that there's some suffering and difficulty, If if, if there's not something that we feel from decisions we make, maybe we're kind of out of sync with the way of Jesus. You know, I think of the 14-year-old girl who decides to make a stand and go public with her faith at school. And there's those eye-rolling and it's like set aside a bit and it's just a bit of mockery. I think of the business leader who lets people know that she's a Christian and She's gonna be ethical about the tax return and her role gets disestablished and I know somebody who's been in that situation and it's hard. I think of the the person who, who steps in to help an aging dad and the dad was never good in their life but now that he's at the end of his life he needs help and the child steps in and provides the care that the dad needs, it's hard. I think of the person who could be out playing golf in retirement but steps in to provide morning tea for mainly music on a Friday morning. There's some sacrifice involved in that. 
I think of the youth leader who shows up on a Friday night when they could be doing something else and they're wondering about whether their youth leaders, you know, teenagers are going to come or not. And they show up and they teach. I, I think of the person who, who sacrifices their financial resources and they feel the pinch of that. I think of the person who gives their, their time to serve. I think of the person who, who invites somebody to Alpha and there's often a sense of what's going to happen. And there's like every drop, every conversation we have, there's the potential for more difficulty, more suffering. And yes, it's not at the level of the Apostle Paul, it's not at what Jesus went through, but there's a sense, even in those, there's a sacrifice, and so we align ourselves with Jesus. It's the beautiful part of what it is to follow Jesus. And when you're in these situations, don't underestimate how hard it is. But neither don't underestimate the joy that can come as you associate yourself with Jesus and his teaching, his life, his suffering, his death, so that you can align with him in the power of the resurrection. Consider it a moment of joy because you have something else in common with Jesus. And when you face that difficulty, remember these radical words of Jesus that if you suffer for doing right, you're blessed, you're fortunate, You're close to Jesus. You're a true influencer that can change the world. You may be treated as a loser, but cheer up because you're on the winning team. Let's pray together. Just reflecting on this, Jesus, we first want to think of the 365 million Christians in our world who are going through significant suffering because of their faith. The men and women and children and teenagers who are in prison or have lost jobs or face financial hardship or physical or emotional pain because of their faith and association with you? Would you provide what they need? Would you come around them in significant ways that they would find joy even in the suffering? And we think of ourselves, even though our level of suffering is feels profoundly different, we still feel it. And we pray that in those moments we feel it, that we would realize just how blessed we are, that we get to be associated with you, Jesus. We want to know you. We want to know about your suffering, your life, that we would also get to experience the power of the resurrection in our lives. And thank you that even though we're treated like losers, nothing could be further from the truth that we're on the winning team. And not because we have done anything, it's all because of your work, Jesus, that when we talk to you and we do life with you, we're talking to one who understands suffering. You drank from a full cup of it and you drank it for us. You didn't do anything wrong, but you stepped out to bring us life, to bring us healing, to bring renewal to the people and places in our world. And so we look to you, we want to align ourselves with you. We say thank you for your incredible love for us. And thank you for the privilege of suffering with you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Amen.